So that appreciation is something that he handed down and that we can hand forward. We have Melody out front and um, that sense of the voice of the instrument, whether it's a violin or any voice, the voice of a clarinet. Um, there's a trumpet player who was just telling me about how when he changed the, the mouthpieces and the length of the board, that he changed the color of what he heard. And that understanding that we can do that as musicians is part of the art that they pass down and that I'm happy to share with you. We're well acquainted with Frank S. Chatfield in this area, and it's interesting that Mr. Schwartz and his son Mike knew Mr. Chatfield well. As a matter of fact, they had an instrument by Hopf, H-O-P-F, that Mr. Chatfield repaired. It was in 1933, and his repair label is still in the violin. They have memories of going to visit him and of sharing that art of luthiership or making of instruments. Mr. Schwartz and Mike also knew Olaf Brevik. Olaf Brevik was in Milwaukee. And Mike shared a story that he was a wonderful woodworker beyond the art of making instruments. And when Mike would go into his workshop, he says to this day, I love going to violin shops just for the smell of the varnishes and blues. It reminds me of Olaf's shop and of Dad's workshop in our basement. But Olaf did something very special. He carved wood chips. And he had this display of uh, sailboats and it was under glass that Mike saw every time he would go into the workshop. And as he closed his workshop, he gave that to Mike. Mr. Schwartz had a robust violin studio. Many people studied with him, both violin and viola, because he was a fine violist. He actually was a violist first, and sort of had a violin as well. He um, would play with me. I, he, I remember playing the great concerti with Mr. Schwartz, the Mendelssohn concerto, the Mozart concerto. And uh, at that point, as a student, you're just learning these. But he had a passion for them, the Tchaikovsky concerto, for example. And he would play them with us and, and give us an appreciation of that which is to come. He led our understanding forward of music that we hadn't yet accomplished, but was just, just coming within our grips. So I'm ever grateful for him to share that experience, that we can get beyond that which would be a student level to see the vision of what comes next. And he, he did that so well. He had appreciation for it. And yet, one of the last articles written about him is about his work with very young children. And he said, if you make it simple, if you keep melodies that they can sing and that they can understand, they just love it. So he was very good with young children as well. He enjoyed the classics. And he shared with me unaccompanied Bach. That's where the violin plays by itself. And um, he also enjoyed the music of Fritz Kreisler. Mr. Schwartz was in the Navy, he had a military background, and he shared that Fritz Chrysler was a violinist that would go to the, the soldiers in the, in the rank file at the front lines and play violin for them. And um, he made, had many short miniature pieces, and Mr. Schwartz enjoyed those. He took me to the what is the Meadowview School now, and that's the first recording that I made. He and Chuck Hocking uh, helped me to record that, and it was the uh, Bach and Accompany Sonatas, and also a Chrysler piece, the Preludium Allegro. And that was the first recording that enabled me to attend Interlochen Arts Camp, and I have fond memories of his introducing me to the recording room. In orchestra, Mr. Schwartz especially appreciated the classics. Haydn, Mozart uh, were some of his favorite composers, Vivaldi. We did play music that was contemporary, enjoyed show tunes, and we would play pops music. But I would say if it what seemed to light him up the best was Haydn. And Mike agrees, Haydn was one of his favorite composers. It's for this reason that on the uh, uh, April 14th concert where we award this award, uh, we are playing the Haydn, we'll play the Heavens Are Telling from the Creation, as well as uh, the Elgar uh, Introduction Allegro, which has beautiful viola music. And both uh, Mr. Ignashak and Mr. Schwartz are violists at heart. In his outreach, to his students, he always kept the voice of the composer, the voice of the music at hand. He was gracious. I, I know that uh, it's challenging in the school system to, you know, he would run between the middle schools and the high school. It's challenging to, to keep all students at many different levels uh, progressing and at the same pace. And yet he did it for so many years. As a teacher and somebody who worked with him one-on-one, -on -one, I always felt like he led me to be the best that I could be as a violinist and also as a conductor. 
uh, he would come running from the middle school because he had that class first and then come to the high school and frequently he would be running behind and he said, Roberta, would you start the orchestra? Can you get him to him? Can you start him on the piece? And so I would and actually, quite frankly, that's the beginning of my conducting career. But as a person, uh, he was warm, nurturing, and his wife Barb was always there uh, for the students that came to their home. She heard many violin lessons and was always welcoming to me. So for these reasons and for what he shared in the appreciation and the perspective that we can share now, not only with my students, but with you about violin, uh, we're happy to award him in the morning the 2019 Chad Field Award. It's with my great pleasure that I'm happy to share a little bit of information about a good colleague and friend of mine, Bob Ignacio. Bob and I were first appointed at uw Milwaukee. Bob was finishing his undergraduate degree while I was beginning one. We had a chance to play chamber music together. I think we were in string quartets, and uh, we also played in orchestra together. Bob has a passion for early music of the Baroque and Renaissance, and I remember discussions about style and technique uh, way back. We've just completed a performance of Mozart's Requiem with Waukesha Choral Union, and so you have, you two have played together for many years, as a matter of fact, we've played together for many years, and um, you want to tell us a little bit about your performing, because you play not only with Waukesha Choral Union, but other places. Uh, tell us where you play. Oh, the Waukesha Choral Union, the Oconomowoc Chamber Orchestra. Suzanne has performed with the Wisconsin Philharmonic, what used to be the Waukesha Symphony. I have played with them on occasion. Many different orchestras, many, many churches play a lot of weddings and things like that. Our first playing gig was actually our wedding. We played the slow movement of the Bach, Bach. double. So everybody wondered where the bride went from the altar. And <laughs> I was playing, I played violin, and he was, of course, playing violin. So sure. that was fun. We played together on the OPAC series concert. You came yes. in and joined me with that one. Mm -hmm. And we've been in a quartet for a long time. You've performed at Festival of the Arts for many years. Bob, you helped us uh, found the orchestra, and you led the orchestra O, which then became Lake Country Orchestra, and we're appreciative of your time there. Well, for me, it was a lot of fun to conduct and lead a group of adults, but also to have former students playing and to have parents of students coming in to play. And there were people coming from all over the area to join the group, and that was a lot of fun to do. It was a lot of time, but it was a lot of fun to do. It was a matter of, um, there were people who hadn't been in orchestras recently, but had grown up playing in orchestras, and it gave them an opportunity to play in an orchestra. And so it was, um, when, we, when you started that group, it was a real, there was a real passion there, and a real sense of, you know, we're here because we want to be here. And uh, I know at one point Bob said, well, would you come and play concert master? <laughs> so for several years, I think I did mm -hmm. that. And, then and we that were, was fun to do that yeah. together. And then we'd go home and I'd get my conducting critique. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. We perform today, we're talking about performing, but you also teach both at the school system and independently. You do adjudicating, you help mm -hmm. organize festivals. and. So that's just uh, a little sampling of what you do. We also know that you are a pretty expert uh, um, dog uh, judge and trainer, and that you had a specificity in Shelties. But anyway, you want to tell us a little bit about some of the other things that you do? And, and Well, um, I judge for WSMA, uh, Wisconsin School of Music Association, uh, frequently. I've judged four times this year, and I will be judging State Festival twice this year, later this month and beginning of May. And I just enjoy judging and uh, listening to students work and try to achieve, and um, being able to give them some constructive comments. As there was a, a gentleman in the orchestra today um, playing violin, and he said, oh, you judged my son. and he. He t was telling Bob how much he enjoyed 
Bob's judging and his comments to his son. And I said, well, he likes doing it. And the man was like, oh, that's obvious. <laughs> so Bob likes anything mm -hmm. with kids. And I've worked with the Wisconsin School Music Association middle level honors groups for 10 years. I was first violin coach for three. I was viola coach for three, and I was orchestra coordinator. Well, actually, I was viola coach for four because I filled in for somebody. That's the tenth year, and representing Oconomowoc for uh, for the whole state that way. And we've had lots of Oconomowoc students in those middle level groups, and it's always a pleasure to see them all together and make contact, whether they're in the honors band or honors orchestra or honors choir. It's a lot of fun, and I missed being there this fall because I wasn't on the staff this fall. Roberta was saying you've done a lot of um, teaching besides Oconomowoc. Mm -hmm. You used to teach with Project Create. I used to teach with Project Create here at Carroll and out in Oconomowoc when we had a branch out there. And now I'm currently teaching for the Waukesha String Academy after school program. And that's so, a that's a Mimi Schweig program, which is a pedagogy out of Indiana University. So it's a it's it's a fun program, and we actually get to teach together there. So. Okay. <laughs> and so I do one night with group classes and some private students, and uh, that's what I'm currently doing with my evenings. Uh, you mentioned my Shelties and my dog shows. Those that was a long time, but that was when I. Was single and living in Oconomowoc and showing pre me. the shelters <laughs> pre Suzanne. Yes, hey, sure. So. Well, you want to tell us uh, one of my favorite things is that one of your dogs had a special musical name. Remember that? Well, actually, two of them did. I had Champion Belton. Josh was trumpet, okay. and he was a utility dog and a breed champion. And then I had Crawford, Beltane, Aria, Doc Capo. And so Aria and Josh were the two Shelties that you remember. And then I had an Obadiah too. Since then, <laughs> lucky. And now, I mean, now we have a miniature pincher who is my constant companion if she's not around. <laughs> Otherwise, she's following she's my baby. Um, I was thinking that um, the, you also have done some things that are not uh, connected with the orchestra. Uh, he's taught chess club at the intermediate, both intermediates, for a number of years. Mm -hmm. I've done ukulele club for a while, and uh, I continue to do chess club in the chess class in summer school. And in my free time, I like to make quilts, and I have ribbons from quilts entered in quilt shows and thing, and the state fair and things like that. Well, I took violin lessons when I was in grade school. And I started guitar lessons the following year, and I played guitar. And when I got to high school, I started strings again. And I decided I would try the viola. And by the time I figured out that I could also play violin, in the marching band. I played flute in the marching <laughs> band, I sang in the choir, but I was in love with playing the viola, and I stuck with the viola. So that's how I became a viola player at UWM. I wanted to tell the story of how we met. Um, Bob had been to National String Workshop in Madison two summers, and I had been one summer, but we had never hit the same summer. So my second summer and his third, third summer. Or fifth, I think. <laughs> we hit the same summer. We had a mutual friend, and Bob had, wanted to play string quartets. Mm -hmm. And I had said to this friend, you find a violinist. I've already talked to a cello player during the large orchestra, and then maybe we can put, read the quartets tonight. And Suzanne was playing first violin in the quartet. So anyway, we married about a year later. Um, Marvin Raven used to be in charge of National String Workshop, so he named us his Opus One Number One. <laughs> so it was the first marriage to come out of that. I, and um, she was teaching at Waterloo West High School the year we were engaged, and I was teaching in Oconomowoc 
and we had a lot of weekends of going back and forth and back and forth. And then we moved here to Wisconsin, and Suzanne started teaching for the Waukesha schools while I taught, continued teaching in Oconomowoc. And so we wound up here. I was impressed not just with Bob's passion, his energy, but also how he talked about his students. And he didn't talk about, he wasn't someone to brag about all the spectacular things he had done. He was talking about, and I tried this with the kids, and this is how the kids reacted. And then we tried this, and, and so he, it was all about the kids. And I've met musicians, and I said, I'm never marrying a musician. Well, he was an exception. But that's why, that's what a teacher should be, is all about the kids. It doesn't matter whether it's music or math or science. You're there for the kids. We're, mm -hmm. we're contributing to making good citizens that are conscientious and as fulfilled adults as possible. And it makes an impact on their life. Well, and that's why music is so important for kids, because um, it's what completes the person. If it's just just reading and math and science, there's something missing. You need the aesthetic, you need the arts, all of the arts, and especially music. There's a lot of research out there that says music trains the brain in any way, in every way, that no other subject can do it, especially when you're playing an instrument. You're firing neurons in every single part of your brain, and those connections linger on so that you do outside of the box thinking when you're working on a math problem or a scientific problem or designing a building because those creative pathways have been reinforced having played an instrument. Listening to music and appreciating music is great. When a young person plays an instrument, that's even better. And. Um I, well, I keep coming back today um, to today's concert, and there, the bass player there was talking about where he'd gone to the school, and Bob spoke up and goes... A former <laughs> student at the same university was a student from Oconomowoc High School. And he's like, oh, I looked up to him, and I'm like, well, Bob was his first, you know, Bob was his teacher. <laughs> and, and Bob has maintained contact with a lot of his students. You have had just an exceptionally large number of young men who stayed with music, and it's really made an impact on their lives. They come up and they tell you their children are playing, also women. To me, it's not, yeah, of course I'm proud of the people who've gone on and been successful in music, but I'm proud of every single one of my former students. They're, they're university professors and doctors and nurses and watchmakers and they've gone to Russia they've gone all over the yeah. world <laughs> and it's been interesting to see how they've grown and developed my parents loved to watch Lawrence Welk and I would watch it with you them you have to say Bob is 100% Polish so he grew up with polkas mm -hmm. so that was his but then there was Lawrence Welk Right, and then as I'm watching, I remember I always watched the string section. And as a little kid, I didn't know the difference. And I always thought, well, the, the guy playing that little darker one, the bigger one. And of course, that was the viola player. And I didn't realize till years later when I happened to catch a rerun or a rebroadcast that, gee, that guy that I used to watch was the viola player. And that was my first experience watching and listening to strings. And now I realize too that as I hear things that I knew when I was younger, Sound of Music, and, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, and those kind of things, I was always tuning into the string parts in the background. Even the pop songs on the radio, I tune into the strings, the string parts. And that, I think that's why I still love to improvise parts in the background. If we're if I'm playing in church and they're playing a hymn, 
I'm often making up something to go with it based on the chords. Well, and you, when you were in high school, weren't you part of Future Teachers of America or something? Yeah, that was an organization I was in. I remember scoring so been some things. You've been interesting, interested in teaching from the beginning. Oh, I think since grade school I knew I wanted to be a teacher of some kind. I just didn't know what subject till high school. But I think I wanted to become a music teacher because of the inspiration of Mr. Stevenson. Mr. Stevenson was my inspiration. I had wonderful teachers there, but I, I think he had a philosophy that music is out there for every kid, and even if they want to just come in and try it for a little while and see if it works, he was going to give them the chance to do it. And he really, really inspired me. Wonderful. Bob, not everybody would understand that you have uh, luthiership skills. You, you have craftsman skills with the uh, instruments. You did some repairs. Look at that. And also <laughs> that you, but, but Bob, also that you did some, um, arrange, a lot of arranging and, of pieces for your students. You want to tell us oh, a little bit about I, that? I love to compose and arrange for my kids. I will, will do arrangements for students of, of pop songs when, when I can. Sometimes it's just translating a piano part into something they can play or changing the key. Um, often for solo ensemble, and a lot of music teachers do this, is we find an ensemble, like there's a, a brass quartet book, and I turn it into different string parts, and then we use that same music. It may be music of Schubert, but it was originally published for four trombones, and now I can flexible arrange it and make it work for whatever combination of three or four instruments I have. But I've composed my own original pieces. I try to do that every couple of years, partly to inspire our students to learn to compose. Because I think like Mozart and Bach, they grew up writing music because that's how they learned. And transcribing music was the first step to composing. and. I think that's really, really valuable. Our music standards call for composing and creating as part of it. We still do a little bit of it. Um, when we used to have orchestra five days a week at the intermediate level, we would do more of it with us having every other day. It's, it's been minimized a little bit, but my students will find out they're gonna be writing by the end of the year. <laughs> see, now look at that smile, see? <laughs> Well, I think a message for my present students and fellow staff members and parents out there is keep an open mind to music. Don't be the type of person who says, I just like country music or I just like classical music. There's a lot of wonderful stuff out there with new age strings. There's a lot of great jazz out there. and. Uh, my daughter's cheering in the background. She was a jazz guitarist and all through school and still plays her guitar. Keep an open mind. You never know. You might find something else you like. So come to concerts like this Mozart Requiem. Go, go to Summerfest and enjoy the music. And well, try I'm, something new. I'm going to interject something, and that's that why don't you mention the variety of areas of music that you have former students either participating in now or have participated? There are former students who are professional composers. There is a former student who's an orchestra director in Winona, Minnesota. There's uh, a professional violinist. There's a bass player who is now a math teacher, if I remember right, who's gigged and played all sorts. He would go from an Irish fiddling jig to a, a punk band and back and forth. There's another bass player who's a classically trained bassist who's playing with a bluegrass group. And but so I, I guess that's, I meant, I brought that up because since he encourages exploration and composing and improvisation and so forth, Bob, you're opening a lot of doors and a lot of possibilities for these kids, both in terms of what they may do someday and what they may appreciate and what will enrich their lives. I remember those Chatfield Quartet instruments 
when we had them in school, we had the case, we students were using them, we used them when someone left an instrument at home and things, and I would try to get them repaired at, within the school repair budget and keep them playable. Gradually we had to retire some of them because we couldn't afford to, to keep repairing first the cello and then the viola. And uh, I know they are an important part of Oconomowoc history because of where they made and Mr. Chatfield having lived in town. And you were going to say something about the well, matched quartet? I was just going to explain uh, what a matched quartet means. And when you have instruments made by the same maker, there's a color and harmony of sound that they're going to have that instruments of very various makers can't achieve the same sort of cohesive sound. Like, um, like uh, a, a maker might want a certain bright color, so all of them might be bright. Or he might um, work instruments to the mellow side. But either way, when they, they like if you're playing parallel thirds, there's this going to be this beautiful harmony and this beautiful tone color that arises because the fact they were made by the same instrument. And from the same, same stock maker. of wood. And from the same stock of wood. And there are famous, many famous quartets over the decades and, and probably centuries who um, they've made a point of acquiring instruments by the same maker, by Stradivari, by Guarneri, even naming their quartet after, uh, after the maker of the instruments. I was just reading about an Australian quartet, it seems like recently, that they all had, um, I don't know if it was Guarneri or Guadagnini, one of the old Italian makers, um, that were loaned to the quartet so that they could all have similar instruments. So. One of the memories I will have, and this was with the Oconomowoc High School Orchestra, uh, the first time we went to Boston, besides playing at a music festival, we got to perform at the JFK Memorial Library, which is off right off the harbor outside of Boston, and the atrium is eight stories of glass. And the students that were there, we were told to change and be very quiet because there was a symposium going on. And we set up our chairs and our stands really quietly. And when they dismissed the symposium, we gave an A to two quietly. And I remember specifically one student whose eyes went, because it was just this wonderful live echo in eight stories of glass and balconies looking down. And we began with Ellen Hovana's Salmon Fugue and played, and they, the word came to me is that we could play as long as we wanted there because the director of the museum was enjoying our music. So that just that look as the sound started in this rich American harmony from an American composer was ringing out and I remember as, we're, as I'm conducting, there's a jet taking off over Boston Harbor and that image of the students and the jet and the sparkling sunlight will forever be stuck in my brain. I'm remembering our trip to Germany because um, you had an exchange, there was an exchange student that came in Bob's orchestra from Germany and it happened that her mother was a utility. Well, um, she was the orchestra director and music teacher at the gymnasium in Germany. And so they came and stayed with Oconomowoc families. And the following the whole year... The orchestra came from Germany. And the following year, Oconomowoc High School Orchestra went and stayed with their families and we performed a joint concert. And um, I took someone uh, along as chaperone and soloist and she did the Haydn Violin Concerto with the, the orchestra. The Haydn Major Violin Concerto. With the orchestra. So and we just had this wonderful connection <laughs> with so the group in Germany. And Suzanne was playing there wearing a necklace. The student had actually become a silversmith, apprentice silversmith, and the first necklace she made, she gave to her mother, and her mother allowed Suzanne to wear it for the performance. So it was a big honor for something like that. And 
that's just another wonderful memory. That and seeing the musical in German in, Ger in Germany. <gasps> on roller skates. On the Starlight Express on roller yes. skates in German in Bochum, Germany. That was fun. That was fun too. So, and one of the students who was on that trip and his father sang in the concert today. They're both That's in true. the choir today. They were on that Germany trip. I'm Paul Walker and I'm a part of the sixth grade Unicall Orchestra. I would like to say how Mr. Lally is a kind and genuine person overall. Not only does he help me, but he's able to help the entire orchestra, which is an amazing feat. I would like to thank you, Mr. Lally, for everything you do. Thank <laughs> you. 